like Phil mentioned, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on under the hood. Uh, I would hate for you to, to do all this stuff all the time. On the other hand, it's nice to know what's going on behind the scenes. So this is a, a chance to talk a bit about all the optimizations that we spent all these years working on. You can look at it, you go ooh and ah, and then you hopefully you can forget all about it and then go back to your application and, and just leverage these op optimizations. But life isn't perfect, and if something goes wrong and you get the performance you're not expecting, you can start to understand a little bit about what's going on behind the scenes and adjust your mental model to um, think about what needs to be different or why you might get the result you, you are getting if it isn't what you expect. And what this all comes down to is keeping these hundreds of thousands of, of compute entities and, and these various disks and these file systems uh, working together uh, simultaneously. And part of the problem is that file systems aren't really meant to be accessed simultaneously. We know, we, we worked on something called PVFS for a, lot, a long time, and it worked really well with concurrent access, but a lot of people are still doing serial access for, for management of data or staging in data, or just because that's what they're used to. And so if you tailor for parallel access, you're gonna abandon a very big uh, serial access workload. Likewise, if you're looking at serial accesses, you may have some problems with concurrent access. No one's made a file system that's perfect at both of those yet, and despite a lot of effort. So that's not a big deal. We can, uh, we, if we understand how the file system is architected, we can adjust our, our behavior a bit to make this uh, a little more friendly to the file system. And it all comes down to this thing called lock management. And, and you may think of like a lock you take in a parallel application or a threaded application where you're acquiring a mutex. And this is a different kind of lock, although it's a similar uh, idea. In a, uh, in a PGAS language, like when you talk about Chapel, uh, there is coordination and, and mutex going, going on. And that's happening a little bit behind the scenes. So when you access that, that remote piece of the array, Someone's something behind the scenes is coordinating and making sure that there's no uh, simultaneous updates there. That happens in file systems too. And just like in a, uh, a PGAS language or a shared memory system, you're gonna have natural units of work. These, these lock boundaries are typically a few kilobytes or a megabyte large. And if you can keep yourself uh, operating on a lock boundary, you're gonna really reduce the number of chances you need to, to talk to the file system and get the information, get that, uh, that, that, that mutex. The problem comes if the file access spans multiple lock boundaries. And in this case, we've got a file access that's hitting three different lock boundaries. Even though the data may be no much, not much bigger than a single lock entity, you're gonna need to, it's gonna need to acquire three locks and, and two of those locks are gonna be shared with somebody else probably. And so this coordination, and, and this is where the, the performance problem really uh, can, can hit, hit yourself. And, and when you do this, this is what Phil was talking about, how if you tailor your access for one sort of locking structure and locking regime, and then move to a different, different system with a different uh, file system, everything is totally different and wrong. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about how this happens naturally. Because again, this is uh, the fundamental building block of why all these optimizations are important. Hi. The question was, how are, the, are these locks obtained from a storage node? And uh, okay, the answer to everything in HPC is it depends. But uh, in this case, it really does. Because in some systems like, uh, like Lustre, the lock is obtained from a, a metadata server that coordinates the, the, the locking. In, in other systems, it's a little more distributed. Uh, you might have the clients might be delegated the locks. And so uh, client A comes in first, gets a big lock. Client B comes through. Someone tells the client B, hey, wait, you got to talk to A for that lock. So um, the storage is responsible for those locks at first, but there may be systems where it delegates to somebody else. Uh, this does happen under the system call level. As an application, you wouldn't see these things necessarily. They will just manifest themselves with performance um, artifacts. So I hope that's clear. You might think you have nicely, nicely behaved data, well aligned, I've got a simple array, uh, and I'm taking just rows and I'm going to just lay it on the file system in natural order and, and yeah, I'm doing great. Except, and, and we'll see some examples of this, it's not uncommon to slap a small, put a small header on top of the file. This header might have some metadata or a magic number or something, some information about the data. And all of a sudden, all of your nice arrays are, are pushed off by 
17K or some, some odd number. And now all your locks are, are going to be uh, not as nicely aligned. And so um, the, the, the problem can get even worse if you're doing uh, column aligned access you know, in, in what you may think of as a nice contiguous access ends up being very non-contiguous in the file system. So again, this is, this is the disconnect between the way the application thinks about data and the way that the file system stores that data. And, and now that you've seen this, we can talk about ways to, to get around that. And these, these IO transformations that are happening in the, uh, the middleware layer are able to do a bunch, are, are, are a good spot to sort of stuff, stuff this uh, file system specific optimization. So we've got two things we want to do here, well, several things we want to do actually. As Phil showed with that performance uh, request size graph, uh, sm small requests in today's systems are, are brutal. So try to get the, the thousands of tiny IO requests into a smaller number of larger requests. Your file system will have some locking characteristics. So, and again, because these, client, these, these file systems uh, may not have been designed to deal with a quarter, three quarters of a million clients, it'd be great if you could reduce the number of clients down to some more manageable level. I mean, get another generation or two out of our file systems. And you can definitely do all this stuff in the application layer, but it, it'll, do, it'll do a couple of things. It'll tie you to a specific machine. You might get it wrong, and uh, it's just not the work that you as a climate scientist or an astrophysicist or uh, a bioinformaticist that isn't really your area of, of specialty. It would be great if you just offload that and transparently to a lower level library. So we'll talk about a couple of our optimizations. This idea of if I have a partial update on a block of data, uh, I can't just update that one little piece of it. Instead, I'll, I'll bring in an entire uh, block or page or, or unit, update that unit, and then, and then write it out. And we see this with SSDs, we see this with RAID devices, and we see this, with, see this with file systems too. So a write takes three steps. Read the data, update the pieces, and then write the data out, the whole block of data. Uh, for a variety of reasons, a partial update of a block is not, is not possible. And we call this data saving in, in the I.O. libraries because we're pulling in a bunch of data. It makes more sense in the, it makes more sense in the read. Uh, the name is a better analogy in the read case. You're going to pull in. 4K or a megabyte of data, keep just the pieces you want and then discard the rest. And that works out better than reading little pieces because, again, the latency problem. And of course, there's a point where if you're only reading one byte out of a megabyte, maybe a small request would have been just fine. But on the other hand, if you're going to uh, read half of that megabyte of data, this is a, uh, a point where we can tune and, and adjust this with, with different uh, uh, tuning parameters. All right, so another way, uh, this two-phase I.O. is another optimization we'll see where, uh, again, this is a little bit, um, perhaps it's a little bit surprising what's going on, right? You have a collective operation and we'll use the, the network in conjunction with the storage. So we'll be able to figure out what all the processes are, are about to do. Then a few processes called the aggregators will uh, well, this is, a, this is an example for writes. Okay, we'll do it backwards. Uh, the processes all have memory, right? They all have a little bit of data in memory in some application relevant structure. And what they want to do is dump it out to data, it dump it out to, to the storage system, dump the data out to the storage system. And they could do this piece by piece and, and issue out all the requests. And again, as we talked about, that would be pretty bad performance. And also, they don't know about the different characteristics of the file system. So instead, we'll use in phase one, We'll use the network. And again, these networks of these systems are, are high-end high networks. Uh, we can push lots of data through them. They're improving at a much faster rate than the storage networks are. So this is great. And, and this becomes better as time progresses to a point. Uh, we're going to shuffle all the data, put it in, a, in the right format on the, this, these aggregator nodes, and then uh, write out the data in, in the way it's supposed to be, big chunks, friendly to the file system. But it has the structure that the application wanted, so you, you, this is kind of a best of both worlds approach. Uh, now we can do this, all processes can be involved, we can pick a subset of processes to be involved to get even better scalability. Uh, and so this, this is a, the, the, the classic example of a transparent, trans, transparent IO transformation 
we're turning many non-contiguous requests into something that's going to be uh, great for the file system. And the reason why you need to be careful about doing this yourself is, is something we've seen quite a few times in applications. Again, it, it all comes back to uh, lock contention and coordination at the file system layer. And some file systems, like GPFS, have very uh, regular lock boundaries. These, uh, you, can, you can line up things on these, these four mega, sorry, eight megabyte boundaries. And if you do that, you, you'll do great. And as you saw from that graph that Phil showed, less than 16 megabytes, you're getting a tenth of the performance. If you can get that large 16 megabyte chunk, you're going to get a factor of, of at least a factor of 10, maybe a factor of 100 uh, performance improvements. However, if you do this page aligned writes to Lustre, which has a wholly, totally different way of managing the locks and the storage on, on the system, performance is tanks. Instead, what you need in Lustre is something closer to this group cyclic, where you have uh, uh, A1 is like an, an OST, and, and so A1 needs to be responsible for this, this chunk, this chunk, and, and so on. And so you, you get something that seems like it's non-contiguous, but because the way the data is striped, you're actually, each client in this IO operation at, at the MPI IO layer is talking to just one of these OSTs. And if you do that, every client acquires a set of locks that can keep uh, and maintain the hold for, hold for the whole duration of, this, of these IO requests. So even though you're issuing many tiny requests, they're actually the way you want them to be on the file system. And we like to say this, is, this was a complicated enough set of optimizations, and this insight was clever enough that it got a paper at SC eight years back or so. And so, again, this is a case where if you do this yourself, and we've seen people do this in, in cloud, cloud bottling, say, where they've come up with their own aggregation schemes and they reduce operations to a small subset of processes, and then they wonder, well, when I did it on machine A, it was great, and then machine B, it didn't work out so hot. And that's because the IO library is doing this optimization as well. And either you are going to be uh, running at, at odds with the underlying IO library, or you are going to uh, just be flat out wrong. So we can talk a bit about a, a simple example. Uh, sorry, the example itself is not so simple. It's, it's a combustion code called S3D. It's modeling uh, like engines. Wow, yes, hi. That previous optimization, does the MPI implementation have to be aware of the underlying uh, topology of the Lustre uh, file system in order to do that, or, or whatever? Yeah, so the question was, how much knowledge does the underlying MPI implementation have to, does the MPI implementation have to know about the, the Lustre file system? And the answer is quite a bit. Uh, there is a, a naive, uh, treat this file system like a generic Unix file system set of optimizations. And for a long time, that's all we had for Lustre. And the performance was awful. And, it, and so people would try MPIIO on their Lustre machines, thought that people like newer bozos, MPIIO is stupid, I'm going to do my own thing. And this has unfortunately poisoned a generation of, of scientific programmers. And we're only just now getting their trust back again. So we have, now we have an optimized, we have for, for a while, an optimized uh, MPIIO driver for Lustre. <clears throat> and yes, it, 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 it does some interrogation of the file system. It figures out the striping uh, of the file itself. It knows that for Lustre, stripes, are, stripes have this characteristic, and so I want to massage the data to, to hit the, the OSTs in the right way. And so yeah, there is a bit of knowledge that's necessary. Uh, topology of the storage is not quite as important as knowing uh, the, the, um, the stripe count uh, of, the, of the file itself. Um, I'm trying to think of the other optimizations that were done at the, in the Lustre driver. The other one was a, a little bit of an adjustment about the data sieving optimization. Uh, but that's less to do with the locking in Lustre and, verse, and more of, um, more of this, this, nat, nat, this nature that what looks to be non-contiguous at the MPI IO layer is actually ideal for, for Lustre. So if, if you were to issue um, if you're to data sieve this request, you'd end up reading A1, 2, 3, and 4's data, and, and that's not what they wouldn't need it on Lustre. So there's some adjustments there, too. All right, so here's a code called S3D. It models the combustion that you might see in an engine or a, or a jet. And uh, you, know, if you, it's a, you want to have the right amount of turbulence. If you have too much, then you lose energy. You want to have an efficient, uh, you want to burn fuel efficiently and produce most thrust out of your whatever end. But 
I don't care. I don't know anything about combustion. All I know about is 4D arrays, and so uh, the 2D and 3D arrays, which is great, because I can get this S3D IO benchmark that our colleagues, Wake, uh, colleague at Waking, uh, modified at Northwestern, and study its behavior when it's working with the IO stack. And uh, so we have, again, the the way that the application thinks about things are these these two and 3D and 4D arrays, and they need to checkpoint a, a piece of the interior dimension of each of the arrays, right? The, we'll talk more about this in the game of life example, but we have this notion of a global data structure and each application has a, a small subset of it. And so you can picture uh, on, on file systems, this is a linear stream of bytes. And so what is logically contiguous is actually very non-contiguous. And so these I optimizations are, are pretty important. And this is, a, this is an old benchmark, but it's a Fun story because we actually sat down and we turned on and off all these optimizations. And the story goes like this. We have this tool called Darshan, which Phil will talk about, which records statistics about what's going on. And so we can count every time there's a POSIX IO operation or an MPI IO optimization op operation. And even though there's only, in this very small example, 64 MPI IO calls, that blows up to 100,000 POSIX IO calls. They're all unaligned. They're, they're, there's only a small bit of data uh, being written, but it took half an hour. And this was one of those cases where I, I, you know, I run it. I think, well, do I have, do I have a deadlock here? Does this is really weird. This benchmark should not take half an hour to run. And it turned out that the, the tuning profile for this benchmark was tailored for Luster. And we were running on our blue gene system. And so some optimizations that weren't good for Luster were turned off. And it turns out they were very important for our blue gene system. And that's why it took half an hour. You know, the whole time of this check of the simulation was done doing I.O. Uh, at the MPI layer. And so that's, that's ridiculous. OK, well, let me turn on the data saving optimization. So the whole point here was to compare the benefit of collective I.O. versus independent I.O., but in this case, it went one step further and, and turned off all the optimizations and used what we call a naive I.O. So we do data saving. And as I said, in data saving, we're going to write more data than we need. We're going to read in chunks of data, modify them, write them back out. But now at four seconds, that's five seconds, that's a much more respectable uh, I.O. time on this system. We, that, that's, that's not exactly what we thought. We, we knew collective I.O. was going to be better, but this is uh, not awful. Again, there's no coordination or, or, or aggregation going on. Uh, there are going to be uh, the MPI I.O. calls are going to break up the request into um, some number of reads, some number of writes. We've got the read, modify, write operation going on. We don't see any reads in the naive case. So instead, we're, you know, we're reading pages, modifying them, writing them out. It's about the same number. It's, it's a little higher because there's an internal buffer inside MPIO. So uh, some requests might have taken two rounds of this data saving to, to, to be uh, satisfied. All right. Finally, we turn on the, the two-phase collective I.O. Uh, algorithm. Collective I.O. makes sense in a lot of cases, especially checkpoint cases, uh, because everyone is at the checkpoint time. We're going to dump this data out right now. We're all working together. Now, if that's not natural for your application, we have to think about other strategies. But for a large class of applications, the applications do hit to this, this point where everyone's going to write out data. And we have, in this case, because it's, it's remember, it's four arrays, a 3D array, two 3D arrays, two, two 4D arrays, and a small parallel net CDF header. That's five operations, all happening from one node. It was all uh, aggregated down to one process. And I know we just got done saying that we want to have IO happening from everybody. But in this case, the workload was so small because, again, I was trying to figure out why this half an hour problem was taking half an hour to run. I kept shrinking the request size smaller and smaller. So it all happened from one process, basically. Uh, these unaligned accesses are very re much reduced because uh, the beginning of the variable maybe was unaligned, but the rest of the variable IO, the MPI IO library could take care of. And we write exactly as much data as we need. And it took only a tenth of a second, uh, sorry, six tenths of a second at the MPI IO layer. And the rest of the time was spent you know, doing the simulation, modeling the data. And so again, uh, that's this sort of benchmark. You might find in your own cases that, that collective IO is not good for a variety of reasons, or data saving was too aggressive. Uh, and, and, and my naive I.O. requests are, fast, are large enough and, and friendly enough that I can turn all these optimizations off and just go right to the file system. But that's the sort of thing you'd want to experiment a little bit and, and, and understand that these low-level tuning knobs are here. And what usually happens is an application person will say, I'm having this problem. The Darshan logs, we look at the Darshan logs, it says something's going on here. 
and we say, well, tune this knob that you didn't know about, but I'll tell you about this, and, uh, and then boom, performance goes much better. Uh, there is, as uh, Phil mentioned in his topology overview, uh, a, a newer level of the I.O. stack called the I.O. forwarding stack, and we'd hope to see some transformations happening there. Now, in practice, uh, we don't see it too much right now, but again, lots of applications sending lots of requests off. They go through an I.O. proxy, and that's because the, the storage systems don't want to see a million clients. They'd rather see more like a thousand clients. That's something that file system designers can, can, can handle pretty well. This is a great place to put optimizations. Uh, things we might do uh, here. We might, uh, we might put the whole file system client on the I.O. forwarders. Uh, instead of trying to mount from 100,000, 200,000, 700,000 clients, now you only have to deal with a, a fewer number of, of mount points. And that's good for all, a lot of these file systems, uh, both for uh, performance and for reliability. If you lose a compute node, you don't have to uh, do any sort of quorum management or pool management and, and get, um, get back to uh, a sane state. The, the, the hopefully more stable I.O. nodes can manage everything much more, much more um, stably. You could, you could imagine uh, requests coming in from 1,000 clients. You could massage those, and you could buffer those up, and you could then batch those out to a, a large single request out to the file system. Likewise, for reading, you might cache that a little bit or do some read ahead. Um, you might, as we've seen in some work, uh, compress the data and then have less uh, network traffic going back and forth between the I.O. node and the storage nodes. Now again, in practice, the vendors have given us sort of a, a bare bones uh, IO forwarding component right now, but if with a little bit of luck, we're able to uh, show our, do, do deploy our own research IO forwarding pieces and, and sort of experiment with these uh, different uh, techniques. And then let the vendors know, hey, by the way, if you do the X, Y, and Z, uh, I think you'll do a lot better at scale. And you know, we've got pretty good relationships with, uh, with Cray and IBM, and, and they've been um, thinking about ways to make their I.O. forwarding a little more sophisticated, or at least give us uh, the right pieces so we can shim our own uh, I.O. forwarding in there and experiment with that. There's a, uh, a note here about compute nodes doing this. And while, again, we don't see too much of this on BlueGene, you could, uh, we've seen our colleagues at Northwestern University do something called a collaborative cache, where if you have your big MPI job, maybe you set aside 10% of those jobs, of those nodes, of those MPI processes. And let those be the I.O. delegates and I.O. cachers. And in this way, it's kind of like the benefit, you get the benefits of collective I.O., but you don't have to do any coordination like you do in collective I.O. You can just fire off your independent I.O. requests off to these delegation I.O. delegates, and they will do sort of the same transformations and massaging of data that happens in the two-phase I.O. case. Go along with this, this theme, we have seen projects called, uh, for example, PLFS, where uh, there was nothing, they, they were having a really tough time doing this, we call uh, N to one workload, where you have a million processes writing out a checkpoint file, a single checkpoint file, what is logically a single checkpoint file out to storage. And for a variety of reasons, they were having a difficult time getting good performance that way. So uh, there's no reason with enough uh, software abstractions that you have to have a single file as long as you can maintain this logical view of a single file. I mean, really, uh, on storage, there's no single hard disk holding this file anyway. So let's just take that idea and, and apply it at the file system layer. And the parallel log structured file system project that was done a few years back uh, puts this library, this interface, and I guess a kernel modification or, or a different uh, data model, uh, in between your application and the storage. And so while we logically think about some number of processes writing out to a file contiguously, what's actually happening behind the scenes is we keep uh, one file per process. And all the, all the data from process zero ends up in a bucket. All the data from process one ends up in a bucket, and so on and so forth. And these thousands of files uh, work out really well for, for Lustre, for example because the lock management is, is done on a per file basis, process zero gets the lock to an entire file, can write everything uh, flat out, and uh, as long as you are okay with 
re recreating the canonical image from a thousand or so files, this can work out okay. This, this index keeps a track of what's going on, uh, sort of a, a log of all the accesses. The, the, the log structured file system suggests that there's going to be a, a metadata component that's going to log everything that's happening. And then the actual data is going to be stored in a big contiguous chunk. The observation here was that in many cases, the read workload is not so different from the write workload. And so when you restore a checkpoint from 100 processes, the zeroth process is going to read the zeroth process checkpoint. And so you don't often have to do a full replay in many cases. Now, um, a couple problems with this approach. You're creating one file per process. So at some point, you're going to have a metadata problem. And as you scale this up to um, tens of thousands of nodes, this does sort of start to fall over. Second, uh, if you do have a very different read workload, then you do have to run all over this new file system organization and reconstruct the data that you wanted. Now, if file per process is so good for PLFS, maybe we should just do file per process everywhere. And that's really seductive. Because a lot of people come to these machines, they run their experiment in a, a shared file approach, they come to a tutorial like me, uh, like I give, and they go back home, they run a single shared file, Performance tanks for some reason, maybe bad tuning, bad deployment of the file system, doesn't really matter. They get a bad experience. And as a pragmatic computational scientist, they're going to say, well, that guy was a bozo. I'm going to do one file per process. Now I get my science done. What we see on our machine, at Mira, uh, uh, a Mira machine at Argonne, is that that's, if you're a small job, that might work out really well. But again, computational, computational scientists are quite pra pragmatic. And if they're going to do a 160,000 process job, they want to manage a single bucket of data. The stitching together, the management of hundreds of thousands of files is just untenable for uh, not just the file system, but your, co your colleagues in the workflow. The poor grad student trying to stitch this, this 100,000 files together into a mosaic of some supernova explosion or do a uh, weighted average of some array that's scattered across all these different uh, files, no, nah, it's, it's just no good. So as we see in practice, larger jobs rarely, if ever, use file per process. And if they did, somebody from our systems would say, hey, stop doing that. You're breaking our file system. So there's definitely, uh, there's definitely an argument to be made for a uh, less relaxed data model where you don't want to have a single shared file. but. Uh, Thousands and hundreds of thousands of, of files is, is too far of a, a correction. Maybe we have an approach where you have a, a handful of files. Or maybe you just skip files altogether, but we're not quite there yet in terms of storage. So a lot of these artifacts come from the fact that we're dealing with the POSIX data model at the lowest, lowest level. And that's, a, that's an old, 40-year-old interface that's really great for your laptop, not so bad for a small set of small you know, lab cluster but really starts to fall apart at, at larger scales for a variety of reasons. But that's what we have. At the, that's our basic foundation. Our basic building block is POSIX open, POSIX write, POSIX read. And we can work with that. We can do these transformations in the library to build something more sophisticated on top of this widespread uh, interface, even if it has certain deficiencies. And we're able to uh, do a little bit. But Going this one step further, if we, uh, if we add a, a data model library like Parallel CDF or HDF5, now the, the, the language we're speaking to the software stack is a little more abstract, a little bit more uh, descriptive. It's, it's both abstract and descriptive. Uh, and we're able to do more optimizations. Uh, we're able to do a little bit about, um, we, can, we can hide details of the lower file system. We can, uh, so for example, in parallel CDF, we can split up a large, a large lo local data, a large logically large data set, into several smaller files, maybe per variable or per chunks. Uh, HDF5 has a similar, even more uh, sophisticated feature, doing something similar. And to the user, again, logical file is all they care about, no matter how it's represented on storage. Uh, as long as you're able to take this bucket of data at somewhere from your supercomputer to your laptop to your, your lab workstation, that's the important thing for a computational scientist. So, uh, I'm going to talk real fast about a real-life case study. 
again, we're going to show this software stack all over and over again because uh, it's the mo mental model of how we think about things. But you saw this just a little bit ago. Again, applications up top speaking in, in some application-oriented library like Parallel CDF. And then on our blue gene, there's an IOD forwarding layer speaking GPFS to our IO hardware. And we've taken Phil's cartoon of a generic file system, supercomputer, and here make it a specific supercomputer. In this case, again, three quarters of a million cores, all tied to some uh, IO forwarding infrastructure. And in this case, if I remember right, the, we, the slowest point of the storage system here is, is getting data between the the storage node and the, um, the storage devices. So when we talk about doing two-phase I.O., where we're shuff shuffling, data, shuffling data around the compute nodes, if we talk about the, the I.O. forwarders, maybe doing some caching or delegation, we have a, a large storage bandwidth on this side of the storage topology. And once we get to these guys, then we have to really start, that's really the, the, the gating factor on how much performance we can get out of this file system. Now, again, you don't, really need to know about the, the really low level speeds and feeds of this system. Um, all you really as a computational scientist probably care about is, is how many uh, iterations of my, uh, of my simulation can I, can I evolve in, in an hour of, wall, of a wall clock time. But these are the, 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 the bits and pieces that are going to be um, the, 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 the coming together to provide your storage, uh, storage bandwidth numbers. So we've got a lot going on, and, and so these, this is just sort of a, a quick tour of, of what's happening behind the scenes. And we'll talk about some of the tools we can use to hide these details, some of the tools we can use to understand what's going on behind the scenes. And the point is that uh, the more data, the more information you can provide to, your, to the software stack, the more of these transformations can happen for you behind the scenes. I think that would be the most concise way I can summarize this. Oh, hey, I got a question. What qualities of a system dictate the optimal number of readers and writers? So the question was, what properties of a system dictate the optimum, optimal numbers of readers and writers? And to a first order, I would say you hopefully don't need to worry about that, because the, a well-tuned library will, will do something clever for you and reduce it to the right number. But of course, in practice, that's not the case. In terms of ballpark numbers, you probably want to have about 1,000 clients and a thousand readers, but that's a little harder to transport, translate into, say, blue gene compute nodes. Each rack of a blue gene compute node has an IO forwarder, and certain MPI processes will become aggregators talking to that forwarder. So the story is a little bit harder to answer. Um, so maybe I should be more specific. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's not too uncommon. Um, I, I agree. I think it's common for that to happen. I just don't know why. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, on the one extreme, the end to end to end problem, uh, you then turn your data problem into a metadata problem, and a lot of these file systems aren't scalable in terms of creating, you know, a million files per second. Uh, more like a hundred thousand files per second. Uh, on the other end, if you just you go a single file, you have this locking coordination problem, and, and a lot of these systems are optimized for a few number of clients, and so they'll issue out locks on a whole file basis, and then spend time revoking locks until you get to the right subset of processes. So a non-contiguous access uh, becomes uh, grant a lock to the whole system, and then quickly revoke that lock until uh, the other thousand clients uh, get, sorry, it's an extent-based lock, slowly shrink the extents of that lock until all of your thousands of clients uh, figure out what, what region they get, and then you're okay. And so if you can amortize that over enough time, it's, it's okay, but really for checkpoints, that's usually not possible. So uh, a few files means that you have a few smaller number of clients fighting for those locks and those resources, a little bit less contention for the uh, you know, to find out who gets to what extents when. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's a, I wish I had a better answer for you, but that's sort of one of those site-specific site answers. It depends a lot on how tuned the file system was for small file creates or large file accesses or, or neither. 
it depends a lot on what you're doing to each file as you split it up. So uh, I think, again, as, you, as you've done, you, you, you did something, it was bad, you, you measured it a better way. That's kind of the way we have to do it right now. There's no, um, there's no good rule that, oh yeah, 10 files, that's, then you're set. Um, I'm afraid there's not a better answer than that.